Today is June 25th, 2024, and you all know what that means. Happy International Random Number Generator Day! This is the day we celebrate the importance and beauty of random number generators, including randomly generating the date of the next International Random Number Generator Day. This is a proud and ancient tradition dating almost all the way back to 2018, and I thought I should celebrate it properly. See, I've been watching a lot of Dimension 20 recently, and that's led me to be thinking about dice. Like, what are the implications of the central limit theorem for role-playing games? This says that if you start adding together independent random samples, such as rolling multiple dice, it'll end up creating a normal distribution, regardless of what the distribution was that those samples were originally drawn from. Rolling multiple dice comes up quite a bit in RPGs, obviously. On one level, this is just a mechanical convenience. With a limited set of dice available, if you want the total possible result to go up, you're going to have to roll more of them. But it's also a nice representation of learning and mastery. When you first try something, your results will be all over the place. Maybe even a flat, uniform distribution like 1d6. Sometimes you do very poorly, sometimes less poorly, with very little pattern to it. But as you practice and learn, not only do your results get better overall, they get more consistent and predictable. Add just one more die, and there is already a noticeable bias towards an expected value. I suspect it's not a coincidence that 7 is supposed to be lucky. By the time you're doing 5d6 damage, the standard deviation is 3, meaning there is a 68% probability that the result will be between 14 and 21. At 10d6, the standard deviation has only increased to 4.3, while the possible range has doubled. More dice means more confidence in what the results will be. I think this is an overlooked heuristic when it comes to evaluating actions in-game. Pay more attention to the number of dice involved, rather than the theoretical maximum possible result. If more than just a few are being rolled, then multiply that number by the expected value of each roll, and you'll have a very serviceable prediction for how things are going to go. So that's neat. But I've also just been thinking about dice as physical objects. There's something very alluring about them. Shiny math rocks and all that. Simple, perfect forms. Except you, D10, you weirdo. I don't collect them myself. I have a single set which I got in 1990, but I totally understand the impulse. I actually made my first set out of paper due to a lack of other options available to a sixth grader living out in the boonies. Anyway, I found myself thinking about other ways one might generate random numbers. Particularly, could all of the standard dice be combined into a single object? Now, Obviously this could be done electronically, but where's the fun in that? Could it be done physically? Well, it would need a display for the results some kind, and if it wasn't going to be digital, that limited the options a lot. So I started wondering about flip dot displays. These are those monochromatic displays with big chunky pixels, like on buses and construction signs. The reason they work so well in daylight is that it's a real physical disc flipping back and forth for each pixel, with one side painted in a bright day glow. They're particularly neat because they don't need any power to maintain a display, only to change it, because the discs are stable in either orientation. A little electromagnet is behind each one to flip it back and forth as needed, but once they're set, they stay that way without power. And that's when I saw this. A seven-segment, numerical, flip-dot style display. I'd never even seen a flip-dot display that wasn't a matrix of square aspect ratio pixels before. And these were just raw modules, without any electronics. I'm not sure why anyone else was buying them, but they sure looked perfect for my purposes. So of course I ordered some. And they were exactly what the listing had claimed. Hold a magnet behind them, and you can flip the segments back and forth. Inside, there is a little disk of steel behind each segment, serving as a core to direct magnetic lines of force, I assume. And then each segment has a little permanent magnet on it, which is what reacts to the external magnet and flips the segment over. It was so satisfying, I spent most of the day they arrived idly flipping them back and forth. I initially had grand plans for a single, unified system that could roll anything from a d4 all the way up to a percentile. What if I had a cylinder with patterns of magnets wrapped around it on the outside? As it rotated, different sets of seven magnets would reach the display, changing which numbers being shown. And you could have multiple dice just by having multiple circles of magnets around the cylinder. Slide the display over to change what it is rolling. The problem is that it would require a rather large diameter cylinder to fit all those patterns of seven around it if I really wanted everything up to a percentile roll. Unless, what if the magnets could be arranged linearly in a neat little row? 
Then I could easily have a hundred rows wrapped around a cylinder of manageable size. That didn't match the geometry of the display modules, but I had an idea that maybe I could redirect the lines of magnetic force, like the existing cores did, just longer and twistier. Like light channels, but ignoring the electro part of electromagnetism. So I milled an aluminum block on which the display could mount, with holes behind each segment. Instead of the cores it came with, I mounted long steel rods. And this seemed promising, as I could still control segments with magnets from the end of these rods. The last step was to try twisting them into a single line. This was awkward and clumsy, but it didn't have to look good. I just wanted a proof of concept, then I could figure out how to improve the process. Maybe I could design it in CAD and get them CNC bent. Or just water jet cut from plate and deal with the square profile. I'm sure that could be solved once I knew it worked. Friends, it did not work. Oh, I could still flip segments, just not reliably. And not always the segment I wanted. There was too much crosstalk between them. The idea seemed dead in the water. And yet, the display modules were still really cool. And I thought it would look really cool to see numbers flipping back and forth before settling into a final result. And I thought it would sound really cool, too. And I wanted something new and fun to take to show off at OpenSauce, which was rapidly approaching by this point. So it was time to narrow my focus. Could I generate numbers reliably using permanent magnets in any way possible? I did the absolute simplest thing possible, drilling holes into a flat piece of wood and pressing magnets into them. And it worked great. Time to start finding the constraints which will give us our design. We'll make a spinning disc instead of a cylinder, with magnets on its flat face moving under the display. We'll want to limit the angular distance between valid orientations so that the display isn't likely to get stuck in between in an undefined state, with some of its segments showing one and some showing two. That would be bad. That means it should be oriented radially instead of tangentially, to get the different sets of magnets as close to each other as possible. That means multiple digit displays are out, so no D12 or D20. That leaves D10 as the obvious choice, to demonstrate as much of the display as possible. Plus, it always was the weird non-platonic die anyway. Do you even know the name of its shape without looking it up? It's a pentagonal trapezohedra, which just sounds super fake. A spinning disc implies an axle and bearings, and I had these 3 8 inch flange bearings sitting around, so I designed around that. And since the display will ride quite close to the magnet spinning in the disc, that means the disc needs to spin true. It can't wobble, so the axle actually needs to be perpendicular to the surface. And at six plus inches across, I really didn't want to turn it out of a single block of material on the lathe. That would be wasteful and expensive. So the axle was going to have to attach to the disc somehow. And since the whole point of this thing is to hold magnets, it would have to be made out of a non-ferrous material like aluminum. That rules out welding the axle on and then just chewing it up on the lathe afterwards. Nope, I was going to need a hub that bolted to the disc, with a press fit axle running through that. So that's what I made. Once I had the hub, I could use it to hold the disc in the lathe and turn it to size. How to hold the magnets in the disc? I tried press fitting them into holes of various sizes, but they tended to shatter unless perfectly aligned. However, if I drilled the hole large enough that the magnet could slip in without much effort, then a drop of CA glue held it in just fine. I used my dividing head to drill the holes on the mill. Luckily, since 10 is a factor of 40, I could just turn the handle four times between each hole, without having to worry about the sector arms. I do love manual dividing, but once you're dealing with advancing it by some arbitrary amount like 3 and 20 21 rotations each time, it gets really easy to make a mistake. Once the 70 holes were drilled, I glued in all the magnets. I only put two in with the wrong polarity, which is a pretty solid 97% accuracy rate if you ask me. But I did have to remove the two wrong ones, which was a bit challenging. Those magnets turned out to be surprisingly hard. I ended up having to use a carbide end mill to get it done. The swarf, which was still magnetic, piled up in weird walls around the shaft of the end mill while I was drilling glowing red with a slowly smoldering fire for minutes after I was done. One of the odder materials I've worked with. With the holes drilled, I could do the first real test after awkwardly mounting the display in a vise. And it worked. A detent would definitely be needed though. I had been hoping it would naturally settle into a defined location, since the magnets would be pulling on the cores in the display, 
And there was a tendency to do that, but not nearly enough of one to rely on. That wasn't any reason not to use magnets for the detent, though. I would just have to add some for the purpose. Back on the dividing head. This time to drill 20 closely spaced holes closer to the center. I also took the opportunity to add 20 divots around the outside to make it easier to spin and give it a good UX affordance, a visually obvious clue how to use the thing. The detent holes were filled with magnets, this time with a simple pattern of north-south, north-south. With that done, all I needed was a way to hold the display relative to the bearing with the detent magnet somewhere in between. Now, I was pretty sure I knew the dimensions needed, but I had been making this up as I went along. It seemed wisest to test them first, so I whipped up an absolutely hideous jig out of a grody old piece of plywood. And it worked! Time to do it for real. I decided it would be best if the disc was tilted back at an angle when mounted. That way, it would be visible when sitting on the tabletop to people viewing it from a wide range of heights. I first made a support for the rear bearing, then got started on the one for the front. The back one could be whatever, it wouldn't be visible, but I wanted a certain elegance for the front one. Particularly, I wanted it fairly thin where the display was mounted. That way you could view the numbers without looking down a hole of some kind. I wanted the display to remain the star of the show. But the support needed to be chunkier for where the bearing mounted, and even more so down where it would bolt to the base. I played around with a couple of ideas before settling on these kind of art deco stepbacks. Not the vibe I was originally going for, but I think it came out pretty nice. I wanted the bearings to be held firmly, but still removable without the use of a bearing puller. So I ran a couple of experiments to see what my options were. I do have a 7 8 inch reamer, but that resulted in a fit so tight that it would have required the arbor press to set the bearing in place. A 7 8 inch drill left far too sloppy of a fit. Worried that I might need to bore them, I tried one last time, step drilling the hole up to 3 quarters inch before finally touching it up with the 7 8 inch drill. And it was exactly the fit I wanted. Snug and firm, but still well within the range of human ability to insert and remove. Always good to remember that the precision you can get with a twist drill depends a lot on how it's being used. I then spent a whole lot of time working out the geometry between the front and the back support, so I could know exactly where to add the bearing bore on the back to match the front, and how far apart the holes in the mounting place should be. And it worked, kind of, but the alignment wasn't great, meaning the bearings were binding a bit, and the wheel didn't spin nearly as freely as I wanted. As I took it all apart again to adjust it, I realized that it worked just fine with only the front support. Oh, guess maybe I should have tried that to begin with. But hey, it works! I found some old scrap to make a nicely heavy base with some rough hewn character, added some recessed rubber feet so it wouldn't slide around as easily and not scratch up surfaces, and it was done. I still want to get back to exploring the cylinder idea to support multiple dice, but I'm pretty happy with how this turned out. And it does sound every bit as great when spinning as I was hoping. And as it slows down, being able to see the numerals kind of morph into each other is a neat effect I wasn't even expecting. Let's see that in slow motion. So, how well does it work as a D10? Unfortunately, I haven't had a game going since the pandemic started. We're going to have to answer this statistically. I spun it a hundred times, generating these results. That sure seems like a uniform distribution, and a chi-square test says there's a 91% chance it is fair. Not bad. My trusty old D10 didn't perform nearly so well with this lumpy histogram, and a chi-square test saying it has somewhat less than a 1% chance of being fair. Yikes. It was a pretty big hit at Open Sauce, where it was definitely the star attraction of my booth. I lost count of how many people described it as satisfying, and I might have caused a bit of a run on the global supply of these display modules, but hopefully a new source will pop up soon. I also took the mostly complete cabinet so people could play Asteroids Kessler Syndrome Edition. Judging from the response, I'm afraid it might not actually be as unfun as I originally planned, but I'll talk more about that in its own video, which should be out next. 
and it was great getting to meet so many of you. This has been a wild couple of weeks, with the Geochron video doing far, far better than I ever expected it to, and OpenSUS just neatly capped that all off. Getting asked to sign badges and pose for selfies is a, a weird new experience for me. Not bad, but pretty weird. If you stop by the booth with kind words, thank you. And to the new subscribers, hello! I can't promise you a regular release schedule or even a coherent channel theme, but I hope you enjoy whatever random thing grabs my attention next. Cheers!